The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins, is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. My, my, my. Bless you, sir. My, my, my. My colleagues across the aisle are going to find themselves in a bind this year because we're going to investigate. We're going to investigate what exactly did happen leading up to January the 6th. You'd have had to be living under a rock in America to not know that there was potential for violence, riot, and mob behavior on January the 6th. Anybody with an ounce of common sense in any kind of connection to the street knew that that was a potential. The United States Capitol Police received intelligence from numerous law enforcement and intelligence services, which clearly indicated the likely, a likelihood of violence on January 6th, and they failed to adequately prepare. Let's look at why. Mayor Browser. My goodness. December 31st, she had one tone when she requested the cooperation of the D.C. National Guard. Now, let me clarify, the, the commanding general of the D.C. National Guard is subordinate solely to the president. The authority to activate the D.C. National Guard has been delegated by the president to the Secretary of Defense and further delegated to the Secretary of the Army. There's a chain of command. It be, begins with a request from the mayor. The mayor made that request on December 31st. The, the president authorized it on January the 3rd, but on January the 5th, Mayor Browns of D.C., who's deeply connected with my Democratic co colleagues here in this body, she had a change of heart, sent out a letter. So we don't want any National Guardsmen here. I got National Guardsmen just for traffic control, wearing safety vests, unarmed, working traffic control and, 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 and crowd control here and there in the city. Certainly not pre-deployed to react and respond quickly to the kind of thing that everybody knew was a potential to happen on January the 6th. So what happened? Were there communications between my colleagues and the Democratic Party and their friend, the mayor of D.C., to have that change of heart the day before January the 6th? We're going to find out. I promise you. Director Ray, will you explain to my colleagues what in law enforcement what a show of force deterrence is, how meaningful it is, and how effective it is as we deal with potential for violence, mob behavior, rioting, uh, violent protest, when things can get out of hand and we know it because of our intel, we have a show of force. Would you explain that in generality, sir? I realize you cannot discuss the case. Share with America briefly how effective the show of force is. Well, well, Congressman, with the, with the caveat up front that the FBI, of course, doesn't do crowd control. Right, but uh, you're right. my thin blue line brother on this panel because the chief but couldn't I, come. For some reason, the chief we invited is not here. So, so you're the man on the panel with law enforcement experience. Just share with my colleagues in America just how effective show of force is as a deterrent if you're facing potential violence. Do you agree with that assessment or not, good sir? My, my understanding is that the, a visible show of strength uh, and security is a very, very significant factor. A very significant violence. factor. I concur. Why do you think, America, why do you think that show of force was canceled the day before January the 6th? I promise you we're going to find out. We will know exactly what happened. And some in this body are not going to like it because there was, there was plenty of intel out there across the country. Many, many field agents had turned in reports at the federal level, local law enforcement. The boots on the ground knew that there was potential for violence in a mob born of protest in a nation that had been locked out of its capital for a year. There was potential. It needed to be controlled. Show of force is a peaceful deterrent. Who could possibly benefit? Let the world ask that question. Who could possibly benefit from the removal 
of a show of force deterrence on the eve of, of January the 6th. I'll leave America with that cliffhanger. Madam Chair, I yield. Gentleman yields back. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals no matter what color they are. When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that, and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, th that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, th where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage ap across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it.
via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, it, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most, uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.